value, conflict meaning, that there's no way to make a concession on that point. Secondly, even if there were something you can't make a concession out of, due to the nature of religion, that is to say, it's something that you believe to be ultimately 100% perfect and right, you, didn't, you have the incentive not to see to that, even if you can. Say, I'm right, so I'm not going to see to it. Under that circumstance, we see that there's clearly conflicts arising from that. Second level of analysis, religion, uh, religion contributing to pre-existing conflicts. What do we mean by this? There are many cases, for example, differences in class, differences in, uh, differences in race, differences in how the ways of life is accepted. The conflict of that is accentuated by the mere notion of religion. The example of the war in Yugoslavia, that is to say, the conflict between the Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbians were really just about Slavs fighting Slavs fighting Slavs, but on the basis of religion saying because we're served, we have to be like a Russian, like Eastern Orthodox, they are fighting against the Croats, which are Catholic. We say that the religion is something that justifies the conflict against each other. But keep in mind here that this, even though like even though it's not the religion is not the direct reason, it is can be a reason for some people who were not interested in the conflict before to be involved in the conflict. Because to say, oh okay, I am not I don't have any vested interest in a conflict against like certain groups living living in different regions like let's say Croatia and Serbia, but because I am Christian Orthodox, now I now have sort of incentive to fight against the Catholic uh, Croats. Under that circumstance we see the religion uniquely the differences unique religion uniquely contribute to conflicts between religion. Obviously, we see that because of the unique nature of religion, that is to say, religion doesn't defend. Religion is 100 perfect, 100 percent perfect to this individual. We see that these wars are number one most likely to happen in many cases. Number two, probably don't stop until one completely defeats the other. So we say that this is bad. Secondly. Okay, so obviously conflicts is bad. Uh, secondly, let's talk about even if you were to have from the opposition a model of the world without any religion, let's talk about why a unified religion uniquely contributes to a people's well-being. Now, let's talk about uh, let's talk about people, right? Because people, in any circumstance, want to opt into into an identity. For example, if your skin color is a certain similar skin color as another individual, that's op that's opportunity for you to. Say Oh, I am the same race as this another person. If you have, let's say, the same income as another person, that's justification for you to say, I'm in the same class as another person. Under that same instance, we see that there are many methods and many ways of individuals to bond with one another on the basis of their traits. Now, these traits are not just about like sustain, like, like the feeling that you're saying with someone else. It's number one, a way to sort of mentally stabilize yourself mentally, that is to say, you know, okay, I am not the only one in this. Well, there are several other people in the world with the same uniqueness that I have, so I can sort of communicate my feelings because the way, way I feel is affected by my environment, and another person has that same environment due to his traits. Secondly, we see that this has a sort of communal bond that is to say, if you have different in the same uh, class, you're probably more likely to cooperate with each other because if you're both poor, you're probably going to have the same goal of being richer, those sort of things. Now, so we see that humans naturally get into an opt into an identity. Now, based on this, let's look at what is the most like ideal identity. Now, we say, we say on our side of the house that it's identity that minimizes the, the, the chaos and the conflict we talked about earlier is something that is the most beneficial identity. And that necessarily has to be as inclusive as possible. Why is that? Because of the because of divisive the uh, device like uh, identification, that is to say, a smaller group, many small groups, has the potential to sort of conflict against each other because A, because they're in small numbers, they have the mobility to attack, like to instigate a large number of masses to move in one direction. B, they have an exclusive mindset, that is to say, okay, so it's only the ten of us, so we're gonna have to fight the world against only the ten of us. Under that circumstance, we see that the inclusive nature in which as many people can opt into that is something that minimizes the harms arising from these traits. So allowing many people to opt in is something that minimizes the, the, the instigation of conflict. Let's talk about what religion, uh, unified religion, is effective in this circumstance. We see that there are no inherent factors involved in defining a religion. It's not whether you're born into a black mother and a black father. It's not about whether you're born into a poor mother and a poor father. Under any circumstance, you have the potential to opt in to a value, a moral, a belief. Under that circumstance, that's why, for example, religions like Christianity or Islam, you have many poor people and rich people opting into those religions. So we see a 
that religion, because you're not born into it, there's no breath culture to, uh, that, that confines you to it, you see that, you see that these religions that arise. So, um, so what have we told you today? We told you that, okay, religion might not be perfect, but if a unified religion is one way to stop the chaos occurring in this world, we're happy to propose. The affirmative has a very macabre and cynical attitude towards religion because in that eight minutes they never really talked about the main objective of religion which is to provide spiritual, religious fulfillment for the people who believe in this religion. We say that to the extent that religion exists so that the weak people can seek guidance, we say that a multitude of religions is far more better than the idea of a single religion, and that's where we stand on the opposition of states to various. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm firstly going to report back to the ideas that came out of Prime Minister. I'm secondly going to talk to you about how spiritual and fulfillment for the individual is better achieved under the model where there are a plethora of religions. Second, thirdly, I'm going to talk to you about what in the world with one religion would look like and how that conflict that they are so eager to prevent would actually be intensified under the model that they are talking about. So firstly, before that, a couple of rebuttals. So they say, first of all, I've got a problem with one thing, right? Because they say, we want a religion that is as inclusive as possible. And we say, if it's as inclusive as possible, how are you going, what kind of religion would it look like? Because if you want to be as inclusive as possible, it would probably be appealing to the lowest common denominator. So there will only be like, what, five tenets, ten commandments, and that's about it. And we say, where's the spiritual fulfillment in that, ladies and gentlemen? You can't, even very, very orthodox Jews or Christians cannot just survive on the idea of, on one slab of stone, that can be written on one slab of stone, ladies and gentlemen. To that extent already, we believe they are behind in today's debate. But secondly, more importantly, a couple of things. Now, the idea that religions cause conflict, right, okay, we're willing to take the bullet on this one. Religions do cause conflict, we admit that. But secondly, more importantly, we say that religions more often than not are only mere tools used by the, uh, by the leaders to kind of exacerbate the conflict or to mobilize different populations. A uh, characteristic which is not exclusive to the idea of religion, but is not, uh, to, but also to ideologies like uh, fascism, like, uh, like uh, uh, dictatorial regimes, and also nationality, ethnicity, race, and all these other things. If you can say that all those things are bad, then we agree with you, but religion is so, not something that should be uniquely uh, condemned just because it divides people. And secondly, look, religions can, all, to, we, and also a counter analysis to this would be the fact that religions can actually be extremely tolerant. The, uh, the, the image of Coptic Christians holding hands around the mosque in Egypt during the, uh, right, during the Arab Spring so that Muslims could pray in peace showed a degree of religious harmony that was previously thought unthinkable in the Middle East or in Maghreb, uh, Africa, ladies and gentlemen. We don't think just because you are religious it means that you are intolerant. We don't think just because you are religious it causes conflict. We're willing to admit on our side of the house that religions do cause or do sometimes exacerbate conflict, but we don't think those are things that religion alone is responsible for, and religion alone has blood on its hands. Lastly, the idea that, look, the, the, the Serbs and the Croats fought over a different version of Christianity. That's true, but the denomination he used was Serbs and Croats, right? Not Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. So the primary conflict in that Serbian idea was not about religion, it was about race. Specifically, it was about the breaking up of the Yugoslav dictatorship after the charismatic Tito had died, actually stemming ethnic hatred between the various countries of Yugoslavia, ladies and gentlemen, not necessarily about religion itself. So firstly, what's this for? So firstly, the idea... 
So the first, the idea of religious fulfillment for the individual, which is something that they totally overlook, which we think is damaging, because religion at the end of the day is for spiritual enlightenment, of the spiritual fulfillment of the individual. When do people start believing in religion? When they are. When people start believing, when do people start believing in religion, ladies and gentlemen? People start believing in religions, or they start looking towards religions, particularly when they are weak, when they need guidance, when they think all hope is lost, and they're looking for otherworldly powers to guide them in this life. And we say on our side of the house, to the extent that religious fulfillment is a goal that the proposition presumably shares with us, because they didn't prop having no religion at all, then we think that uh, having a multitude of religions is important for that. Why? Precisely because we are all individuals with different concepts of the good life, different concepts of salvation. Some people prefer that there is an omnipotent and omniscient being who is able to save you and protect you from the mouths of hell and then bring you to heaven in the afterlife. Other people would like to believe that the good acts committed in this life would create enough karma so that they will be reborn into a better world, ladies and gentlemen. The ideas of spiritual in love fulfillment, the idea of religious uh, salvation is different from person to person. The idea that there is one common religion that will somehow fit every single person, like a cookie cutter, is non-existent, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to respect people as individuals, then you want to start treating them as individuals. You need to start recognizing that they have individual needs. You need to start recognizing that they are unique in their own way, and they deserve more religions. Secondly, the idea, lastly, the idea of what a world with one religion would look like. Right. This actually did happen at a certain point in time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about 13th century Europe, when there was only Catholicism, and that was the main religion, and you were either a Catholic or you were an infidel. What happened with that? Protestantism was born out of Catholicism being the only religion. Why? There are some actions that are unique to religions, basically. There will always be marginalized groups in that one religion, ladies and gentlemen. Because contrary to the idea that they would have you believe that religions should be as inclusive as possible, what we told you specifically is that if you try and make it as inclusive as possible, you end up making it not stand for anything at all, ladies and gentlemen, because what you are doing is you're trying to save everybody, but because everybody has different needs and you incorporate that, you end up saving nobody, ladies and gentlemen, precisely because you have so much needs that you need to tackle and you need to address. There will always be some marginalized groups because religions fundamentally have to be exclusive in order to provide the exclusive benefits of salvation that are offered to you in that particular one ideology. We think that there will always be marginalized groups. Like for example, if, for, if, Catholic, if we take Catholicism to be the one common religion and we assume that Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and uh, Zoroastrianism and Tengriism and all these other religions didn't exist, what would happen is that the gay would remain marginalized, would be devoid of spiritual salvation. When they could have been in the status quo, but saved because some sects of Protestantism have started ordaining gay bishops. Some, some sects of Protestantism have started legal, not legalizing per se, because it's not a thing, but started accepting gay marriage, ladies and gentlemen. A plethora of religions allow you to have benefits, not just in one religion, but in another religion. But if you have one religion, there will always be these marginalized groups who will be uh, who will be prioritized, uh, who will not be prioritized, who will be devoid of religious salvation. Secondly, we will tell you that there is always going to be dissidents, right? Because as much as they will have you believe that there is only one interpretation of text, that does never work in the history of religion, ladies and gentlemen. Out of Catholicism, and that's one interpretation, we have Protestantism and its many versions of interpretation. We had Eastern Orthodoxy out of Christianity. We had Shiites and Sunnis coming out of the same religion of Islam that did uh, originally have the same God. We think that there will always be dissidents. And why is that a problem? Because the conflict that they wanted to avert would happen anyway. Because you are trying to stop these dissidents from creating a new religion, ladies and gentlemen. To the extent that you will have conflicts in terms of interpretation or in sex, we don't think that the proposition is any better than the status quo. What have we told you? We told you that they fundamentally ignored the idea that religion is for spiritual enlightenment, spiritual fulfillment. We told you that a plethora of religions allow you to do that. We are willing to admit that conflict does occur as a result of religions, but that will happen anyway. Or even under their model. We're very proud to have
women and men fighting against each other on a national skills of like violence, or in the case of black and white fighting on a national skills as well. We fundamentally believe that because religion in and of itself is something that propagates the very core identity of themselves, and because this core identity can never be, a, can all, is always mutually exclusive, and can never be incompatible to begin with, we think this is something that's extremely harmful. But even if we were to, uh, um, even if we were to concede that this in of itself might not be unique, we think this debate is a, is a comparison. Meaning that on the side of our question, when you simply propagate more of the difference between the religion by having different kinds of religion, you create more of the conflict on their side of our question. We fundamentally believe on the side of primitive, we alleviate that harm, which nicely moves on to my second idea on how we better create more benefit to your religion. But before that, let's talk about the response that came from the opposition, or the benefit that came from the opposition. He told us that spiritual ideas and benefit cannot be achieved on their side of primitive. We have three responses. Firstly, we don't really understand why that value of you simply believing in one specific religion is only going to be a useful exclusive benefit on their side of opposition. Because this debate is an assuming debate. We prefer that this religion, different kinds of people come to a unified consensus to begin with. In that specific situation, we think obviously you actually do share the value and decide that this squad is in themselves and this value is something that we all want to believe in the very first place. That's why we agree that there might be different demand, but, but considering that these gods and different people actually came together is an extreme proof that actually proves the very fact that they, like, they also do regard the benefit on their side affirmative. But secondly, they told us that marginalization happens as if that's a mutually exclusive harm on their side affirmative. Because on their side of opposition, when the majority and minority really, depending on the context that you're talking about in the society, because religion exists, you will always be marginalized also on their side of opposition. That's not a mutually exclusive harm considering that people actually regard people as different on their side of opposition. But thirdly, they told us that exclusiveness is something that's extremely harmful. Because but we fundamentally believe that this is this is like this is not something that is uniquely harmful in today's space in the very first place. Because we need to understand that even if we were to concede that there might be like religion in of itself might be exclusive, at the very same time within the religion, you're able to share that benefit on their side of friendship. So just because you being inclusive does not mean that the benefit of seeking for help is not going to be guaranteed on their side of friendship. If people want to seek for help, when they are extremely depressed and when they want to seek for help for God, they can do that because God and deity don't exist on their side of primitive. We need to understand that this is something that's a benefit that also exists on their side of primitive. But in addition to that benefit, we're able to create more choices towards these people because they're able to believe in one God and share that value with more people on their side of primitive. Why is this more likely to happen on their side of primitive? Because we need to understand that as quoted from Prime Minister, people are able to sympathize with each other and acknowledge that, acknowledge that their difference in themselves is not a huge matter that they, that, that they need to deal with in themselves. Because when they share the same God and they uh, uh, when they share the same God and base their actions such as marriage decision, food decision, lifestyle choices based on that same God, they're more likely to disregard the difference that is in it to them. They're more likely to think that we are all same together on their side of primitive. But furthermore, we're able to lessen the conflict on their side of primitive. Within a universal, like unified religion, we are able to create more discourse to be able to check each other on their side of primitive. And that's a mutually exclusive benefit on their side of primitive. Because fundamentally, on their side of primitive, you don't feel alone because there's many people that surround you that have the possibility of sharing the same value or sharing the same painful experience on their side of primitive. That very incentive makes you to be able to correct other people. If someone is trying to kill other people or discriminate other people, you're more likely to correct them on their side of primitive because you don't feel alone and you feel more likely to be empowered on their side of primitive. Fundamentally, we need to understand that this debate is indeed a comparison. When the status quo does inflict more harm by virtue of different religion creating exclusivity, we think that's, not, we think that's not a harm that we want to take on their side of primitive. But comparatively, when we're able to guarantee people more choices and to be able to, have, to, be able to like, increase the quality of life of every single individual, when they're able to share more of their balance with more people, we think that's something that's much more better. We're extremely proud of this report. Mark, now I'd like to call on the second negative speaker, Mark Krilov, to deliver their case for this eight minutes. Here, here. Good evening, infidels. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, today's proposition side seems to be very confused and very liberal with the facts. They use very strange examples, such as Croats and Serbs. They probably should be reminded that hey, Croats and Serbs are basically the fulfillment of what they want. They follow the same religion, it's called Christianity. They read the same Bible, they have the same 
moral and spiritual values. They basically follow the same rights. The only difference between Catholics and uh, Orthodox Christians is where does God power emanate? From Father and Son or Father, Son and the Holy Spirit? That is a very important question. So basically those people already belong to the same cult, to the same religion, and that doesn't work. That negates their proposition. Why that doesn't work, Mr. Speaker? Actually, Croats, Serbs and Bosnians used to live under the same country, it was called Yugoslavia, for decades, peacefully, without ever shedding blood on each other. Why was that possible? Because Yugoslavia was a secular country, that means everybody could choose the sort of religion everybody wanted. And therefore, there was no imposition of this sort of unity on everybody, and therefore people could live in peace. But then Yugoslavia broke up, and there arose national, gov national governments, national countries. So Croatia was now for Catholics, Serbia was for Orthodox people, and Bosnia was suddenly for Muslims. And this is where the problem started, when people started imposing a uniform religion on people who were not fit for that. And that is where the strife, the conflict, and the bloodshed started, Mr. Speaker. Today, I'm going to explain to you why peace is guaranteed under pluralism of opinion and pluralism of religions better than it is under unification and oppression under the smallest common denominator. But first, a few reputations to the proposition side. First of all, yes, let us assume that we can all be united under one religion. After all, there have been periods in world's history where significant portions of the world have been united. The medieval Europe was predominantly Christian. The medieval Middle East was predominantly Muslim. We can assume that. But what we cannot allow them to, to assume is that there will be no religious differences after that, Mr. Speaker. That is not realistic, and let me explain this to you. Okay, they say, let's share the same values, the same Ten Commandments. Sure, everybody can agree upon that, well, Mr. Speaker, three major world religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, share the same values as they pointed out. Do they agree among each other? Does that, universally, does that automatically lead to unification of those religions under one cap? No, that doesn't work. Okay, but maybe, well, if you preach the same God, maybe all Christians coming together could live peacefully, but that doesn't work. Catholics have been at war with Protestants, have been at war with... Uh, uh, Orthodox people, and so on and so forth. Okay, we see. Maybe at least one sect, people belonging to one sect, agreeing upon most things, can live peacefully. Well, look at Orthodox Russia. In the 17th century, we had a civil war. You know why? Because one group of people believed that you should lay a cross with three fingers, and the other said no, with two. So there was bloodshed above, above this, Mr. Speaker. No matter how low your denominator is, there will always be differences because people demand from their religion different things, Mr. Speaker. Your major world religions cannot agree on the number of wives one person can have. Christians say you should have sex with one woman and one woman only in your life. Muslims say no, I want four. And I'm actually maybe entitled to nine. And I say I don't want zero. Okay? <laughs> We can't agree upon those basic things, so there will always be sectarian strife. And this has been explained by Paul at length. Then they say, uh, okay, people can seek salvation in one religion. This is the core tenet of our case, Mr. Speaker. No, people are very different. Some people, a billion of them actually, seek salvation in religion with no God, in Buddhism. Some people seek salvation, do not seek salvation at all, as me, I'm an atheist. And some people seek salvation in people with one God. Some people seek salvation in people with multiple gods. Some people seek salvation in really hardcore cults that demand from you that you do not eat, do not drink, do not do uh, anything that is considered immoral. And some belong to very liberal cults, Mr. Speaker. People are different, and things that they seek in religion are different, which means that there will always be sectarian strife. And now I'm about to explain why there will be more strife more conflict under their paradigm and not under our paradigm. As I was saying, Croats, Serbs, and Bosnians used to live under the same state for ages in Yugoslavia. Peacefully. Why? Because there was no oppression, because there was no unified religion imposed on all of them, Mr. Speaker. Same thing. In British Raj, India, Bangladesh, and modern Pakistan used to live without religious strife for centuries under the British colonial rule. 
But then they suddenly decided to create nation states, and each nation state should have its own religion. And that where the problem started, and that where the bloodshed started. We believe in peace in pluralism. Why so? As we pointed out before, all people are different. They all come to religion or don't come to religion with different values, with different demands, and with different needs, Mr. Speaker. If you impose upon them one single religion, it will mean that there will be people who disagree with the basic tenets of this religion. There will be people who still do not find the salvation they came for in that religion. And therefore, they will probably split from, from that religion, create a different version of it, and so on and so forth, Mr. Speaker. How do you maintain unity in that case, I wonder? Through oppression, through brainwashing, through very harsh treatment of everybody who disagrees, even for one millimeter, with the doctrine that is being imposed on us. What is this going to create, Mr. Speaker? Look at what is happening in the Islamic State. They, they pretty much managed to impose a very strict version of uh, Sunni Islam on everybody. But how? Through bloodshed, through killing of innocent people, through oppression, 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 and oppression, Mr. Speaker. Why did conflict in former Yugoslavia happen? Because some people decided to create states only for Catholics, only for Orthodox, and only for Muslims. Now they want to create a whole world for that future religion of theirs. We believe that this can be done only through oppression, which will disenfranchise lots of people of their basic rights, which will make lots of people unhappy, Mr. Speaker. And that, ultimately, through oppression and through differences, that bring different people to different religions under status quo will lead to strife and even more conflict as it did in former Yugoslavia, as it did in former British India, as it did in many, many other places around the world where different religions live peacefully with each other and where problems started when something unified was imposed on them for the first time. Mr. Speaker, in order to preserve universal peace, in order to preserve for everyone the right to follow or not follow the set of values and beliefs that one sees fit. And finally, in order uh, uh, to guarantee everybody's right to do so. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
feels more to selected individuals within that framework, right? Because we would question how many people honestly read every single like, word of the Bible in order to sustain their beliefs, right? What we would suggest is that many individuals feel the same sort of like values from every all religious people, often into the same sort of values from the religions that they believe, religions that they believe respectively. All of them to balance are things, like the, the definite value set, or for example, divine beings being there to provide salvation to you. All of these things are common to many religions. We said the most important parts of religion are actually apparent in every single religion that exists. That's why we don't need an extremely large number of tenants to appeal to every single small preference on their side of the house. Because their assumption was that some people are going with a preference for reincarnation over going to heaven, or they have a preference for having like, more gods over a smaller number of gods. We don't think so, right? We don't think that individuals are inherently born with preferences towards those extremely small and minute details. These are, are these are artificially created afterwards because we're born in the religion, right? We don't think that people actively choose, for example, certain religions because they have more gods than the other religions. We don't think that they choose certain religions because they can be sent to heaven and not be forced to, for example, reincarnate. That doesn't occur, right? Most individuals choose religions because they happen to be born into the religion, but they choose to continue to follow that religion because it provides them extremely important values, salvation, divine, like, uh, divine values that are definite to you. These are things that can be considered, and these are things that we provide in every single religion, or in the unified framework of religion that we provide under our standards. And that's why we see no need to adhere to more individuals, or to smaller, or smaller groups of preferences that don't even exist. But second of all, we're more than willing to say that fulfillment is going to be better achieved on our side of the house. Because we told you from Deputy Prime Minister, those never really responded, that oftentimes the very, the very meaning, or the fact, or what provides religion authority, is the number of individuals that believe in it. The fact that you are not contradicting every single step you take is an important part of you being able to be confident in your religion. When more people believe in the exact same religion that you believe in, you're going to feel more authority in your religion. Because you're not going to have, for example, people on the streets that can believe in completely different religions. You're going to be able to say that all people believe the same religions, and therefore I can have more confidence. It's extremely important in providing these people an extremely small, strong sense of emotional security. That's an exclusive benefit that we provide on our side of the house. But second of all, not all religions are necessarily equal in society, right? Often, for example, unfortunately, certain religions are discriminated against. For example, Muslims are oftentimes marginalized and risk on liberal democracies. That's why these people, under their paradigm, are forced to trade off between being marginalized by society and being able to access divine values. On our side of the house, because every single individual, or the majority of individuals, or a large number of individuals, believe in the same religion, it's going to be extremely difficult to discriminate people based on their religion, because we all believe in the same religion, although maybe to different extents. That's why these people are going to be able to not only access the basic goods that religion exclusively provides, but also not have to suffer social marginalization. We think that's extremely beneficial. Second question about the conflicts that they have said. Because the deputy leader of the opposition told us that like we create conflicts in order our uh, leader of the opposition told us that we create conflicts in order to hold in distance because there's going to be, for example, people who believe in different interpretations of religion. But firstly, notice that many of the beliefs that were the cause of conflict were things that are not important at all. For example, like the number of fingers you use, I don't know. But lots of these things are not going to be a part of conflict under our paradigm, right? Because the reason these things are the cause of conflict is because they're explicit stated within the Bible, or there are things, for example, in the Bible that talk about these things, right? It's because religion actively takes a stance on these things, or the stance is oftentimes blurred, but this religion still takes things that can be interpreted to be stances against these nitty-bitty parts of religion. We say when we abolish those, and we start to stop taking stances on the most minute details that exist, we're not going to have those conflicts anymore, because people are not going to be fighting about how many fingers you use, because that's not going to be something that's relevant to religion at all, because that's going to be eliminated from our religion, because our religion is inclusive, it's larger, and it appeals to more individuals, and that's something we say is extremely beneficial under their interpretation. But what we have to recognize is that differences arise anyway, right? We agree, there are going to be people who are not necessarily absolutely satisfied with the current religion, and that's something that occurs in either paradigm, right? Because people are going to be like dissatisfied with anything, and people are going to, for example, like to branch off and create smaller groups. All of these things, people are going to try to create, for example, the more exclusive identities. All these sort of things naturally occur and definitely occur. The question then becomes, which side of the house is better able to reconcile that? And that's something they never engage to on their side of the house. Because what we would suggest is that by having a common framework which many individuals opt into, we're going to be able to reconcile these differences better. Because people, for, for, for example, don't necessarily believe in the exact interpretation that is dominant under the status quo. Might, for example, feel business, but they have a larger incentive to listen to people who share the common religion compared to the random people of, of, in another part of the world. Right? That's why our side of the house is going to, for example, be able to mobilize moderate believers who say that you shouldn't fight or be 
solution, for example, we should love our neighbors, or maybe we should, for example, have both interpretations. That's something that's probably better for both of us. All these things are more likely to occur and more likely to be effective because not only are there more modern believers in society because they're naturally more believers as a whole, but there are also more people for these dissidents or people with dissidents have an incentive to listen to. So that's something that we say is better. But second of all, we say that the number of people or the propensity for dissidents to occur is considerably smaller, right? Because oftentimes the reason dissidents is created is because, precisely because, of feelings of isolation, feeling that you are not appreciated. Oftentimes, for example, the reason most radical Muslims become radical is because they feel underappreciated through society. When we have a more inclusive framework where more individuals share something common to you, or where there's a higher propensity of an individual sharing the exact same purposes as you, which is the same religion, because obviously there are going to be more individuals in religion, the propensity of if someone sharing the same purposes as you is going to be significantly higher. You're going to feel less isolated. You have a higher propensity of finding communities that not only share your religion, but also share other aspects of your beliefs. And that's something that's far more beneficial because these people are less likely to be isolated and less likely to create dissonance. They also told us that we're going, because we're forcing religion on these individuals, it's going to create dissonance and anger. We're not forcing religion on these individuals, right? If this religion doesn't suit you, just opt out of it. We don't think we don't see any problems with that. But the problem, we are not enforcing or forcing certain religions on these individuals. The same way that we don't, for example, force certain religions on other individuals. That's an entirely different debate. This debate is not about forcing this a single religion on the individuals. If it doesn't suit you, just opt out. They told us about pluralism, how we have to respect many sorts of ideas, etc. The problem is we agree that there are many things in society that create, for example, conflict, but also have the potential to, for example, be fulfilling. For example, political opinions, different political opinions, we agree, also create, for example, conflict and the same amount of potential to be fulfilling. But the important part that they missed in this debate is that religion as a unifying framework is able to overcome things like racial differences, like differences in political opinion. These are things that are necessarily going to create conflict on their side of the house. Anyway, on their side of the house, we're going to be able to be the more inclusive framework to prevent the harshest harms from occurring as a consequence of those differences of political opinion. And that's because, that's why, even though they say it's not unique, that's not the point, right? What we're saying is that religion is a unique counter narrative to this dissonance, to this unique divide, and that's why how we protect individuals in society. We're massively proud of the <laughs>
city or the, like a certain regions or whatsoever. This is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, opposition science has been keep telling you and it's impossible to completely unify and create a single form of salvation and given that people are different identity and different background. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, the idea coming from government side is nothing but unrealistic. Number two, like the creator going just the, try to compare like the, the benefit and harm coming from both two sides and the perspective of reconciliation without not telling us as to how the religion is a unique figure to cause the, like, uh, the conflict and then just try to say the religion might accelerate the conflict. Several responses. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, like a dear Lord have already talked to you and just because you have a religion doesn't mean and like we can automatically accelerate the religion. And the Max has already exemplified the case as to like where we don't have one singular imposer over individual thoughts, actually the multi-religious society was peaceful at that moment. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, auction time harm is much more highlighted at the end of the day because we've logically proven to you as to why once the existence of one singular imposer over your thoughts necessarily fuels the conflicts over individual thoughts and highlight the differences to preserve the integrity of the religion at the end of the day. This is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the reconciliation and because we have one singular body of imposer and we unique one more mechanism to fuel the thoughts and fuel the conflict between the people and the religion. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we think that the conflict will much more be fueled at the end of the day. <clears throat> And lastly, and he somehow told, just because we have the same religion and we're not going to force every single individual to believe it. What? And you'll be born into your religion and there will be no other options available for you in the own counter paradigm. This is what Krita Kun has said by himself and he contradicts by himself at the end of the day, alas. <clears throat> So that's why, ladies and gentlemen, that we substantially coerce the incentive, I mean, like, coerce the religion as a, in, in a constitutional manner. So, having rebutted, moving on our cases, number one, what does it mean having one unified religion? Ladies and gentlemen, as opposition has consistently told you, having one religion doesn't mean everyone in the world will get obedient to your thought, precisely because inherently your thought is not completely determined by the tenet, and it's consistently explained by two speakers. And when we found the response the from the Shogun, it's like, no, having one unified religion makes it happen. And the question is, how? And Shogun himself answered, more choices available by welcoming more people and diversity of thought will be achieved. Yeah, this is what the opposition side has been telling you. As long as the people have a different idea as their individual, and this is why diversity will be created. And, <clears throat> and this is the severe concession coming from Deputy Prime Minister as to how it's impossible just because we have a one single religion and to create the one singular identity as a uh, like a human being, as a social body. <clears throat> This is why, ladies and gentlemen, even the counter paradigm, the counter factual they, they draw to you, and we still see the difference of thought, and we still see the existence to be different based on your thought. This is the clear accountable, that's the baseline to examine what kind of harm and benefit will be created, and I'm gonna examine on, to, on that on the second clash. So, meaningful impact. Basically, on this clash, the what Darwin Hassan has taught you is really simple like dissolving into religious conflict. Done. <clears throat> so I have, uh, how, how many, yeah, basically three responses. Ladies and gentlemen, number one, this is really do, do, dubious logic as it is, because what government has mentioned to you is just the showing two dots and say something is relevant by just proposing the difference of religion and the existence of conflict without telling you why. And on the other hand, opposition side has already answered as to why just having a different religion doesn't mean conflict will be filled. And, and we've already told you there are lots of determinants of differences and conflict, let's say race, let's say economic condition, and let's say the, the place you are living. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we can't see how actually good the world will be because just because we have one less difference at the end of the day. Plus, and to further disprove that uh, like argument, and we can say that there are a few religions that ex explicitly mentions a new believer should fight. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, Islamism had a system of capitulation which happens the cooperation between the collective Christianity and Islam, uh, Islamism. And the leader of opposition, and deputy leader of opposition, has already told you 
and how much the uh, corruption Christianity and Muslims and uh, or Hanley Han in the case of a rap split. <clears throat> this is why, ladies and gentlemen, Pericles paving just because having different religion and can't be opposed of the father conflict. Plus, <clears throat> and like a, they didn't they didn't prove how actually having different religion and makes you really upset or unsatisfactory, so that they waged a really risky and dangerous act called war. And there must be a severe reason to make that like a make that happen. This is what actually like ISIS are doing by like a, a like by using the aid to gather the people's attention, not actually like by the religious incentive or whatsoever. <coughs> That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we can't simply conclude having one less, having one less religion will practically achieve the better world. On the other hand, what opposition side has brought to you? We told you, like, the demise of the very purpose of the religion, I mean, spiritual salvation. Because the devoid of the thought as a consequence of the purposes of inclusion, and we can achieve nothing in there. And moreover, ladies and gentlemen, you, you <clears throat> because of the, like, a, Attempt of the religious organization to stay integral, like uh, the, the, to keep their integrity, and it will trigger the unique incentive of the religious organization or members of that to suppress the other thoughts at the end of the day. Because, like uh, many people, are afraid of the existence of differences, and because the incentive of the religious organization to stay the integrity and to stay the current regime. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we told you there's no unique benefit coming from the side of government, and the, the, the opposition side had to prove. To you, we can add one unique incentive for the most oppression. This is why opposition are proud to oppose. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Speaker, for his work. Now I'd like to call for the negative reply speaker in the closing debate within four minutes. You're here. So we had quite a, a debate that looks not much mutually exclusive, but we're going to try and make it as mutually exclusive as possible by looking at two things. I'm firstly going to examine the nature of the conflict that occurs as a result of having one religion and multiple religions. I'm secondly going to look at the spiritual fulfillment that you get from believing in a religion and whether, which is, which, uh, and whether it is more achievable under our paradigm or their paradigm. So the first point about conflict. So basically we have two versions of inter-religious conflict. One is a, a, a battle between religions. Two is our paradigm of a battle between the religious and its dissidents. And we're going to look at which one is more likely and which one is more pernicious. Firstly, the idea given from the negative side about how inter-religious conflict is more likely and more bloody. To an extent we say we didn't fully oppose this and we are willing to concede that uh, inter-religious conflict does happen, but we also told you that it's not mutually exclusive to our case. But and <coughs> What we uniquely told you from uh, a side opposition uh, concerning the conflict uh, between the religious and the dissidents is that basically the mechanism that religions can coexist peacefully in a certain land as long as there is no one superior common religion that is trying to impose its views on the other people. We told you quite clearly how Islam, uh, Muslims, and Christians were able to coexist in the Holy Land, coexist in the Middle East uh, at, at the point to which they at the point to which they were coexisting peacefully together. But the moment, and ladies and gentlemen, that you started adding, uh, sorry, wrong example, the British Raj, British Raj, the British Raj where the Muslims and the uh, Hindus and the Buddhists were cooperating peacefully together, the moment you give them a superior ideology, the moment you start, uh, give them a superior ideology and give them land, That's when you start to have that kind of conflict. We, we say on our side of the house, at the point to which you have a common religion that is more authoritative than the other religions, it stops becoming a battle of relativism, which can actually be conquered by a moderate person saying, you, 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 we can work together, like the Coptic Christians and the Muslims, ladies and gentlemen. At the point to which there is a common religion that you subscribe to, and all the other ones are inferior, that's when you start having less of a discourse, less of le and more conflict. And that's why we think that having one common religion means that there is more likely to be conflict, ladies and gentlemen, because you are adding that degree of superiority. Secondly, the more important goal of, uh, the primary goal of religion, which is belief. And here is where pro uh, affirmative gets really, really sloppy. Because they say, 
It's going to be as inclusive, uh, firstly, they say it's going to be as inclusive as possible and therefore as, uh, as accommodating as possible and we would have a lot of tenants and we will have a lot of choice, which is basically the status quo. And then secondly, they say, look, you will be born into a religion and therefore there will be no differences and these are all trivial, despite us telling you that there were times when there was one single religion and people were born into one single religion and yet dissidents were formed uh, even though in 13th century Europe there was only Catholicism and people were born into Catholicism and yet out of that Catholicism Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther still decided to say that he had 95 reputations against the Catholic Church and then nailed them to the church wall in, uh, in Worms, ladies and gentlemen. We think that that is something that they fundamentally overlooked on their side of the house. Just because you are inclusive, it sounds nice, but they're not standing up for anything. What we tell you on our side of the house is you need specific tenants that can to specific people's specific needs. It might be a little more divisive, we're willing to accept that. But as long as you say, on a secular perspective, that there is no superiority, we can avert conflict to the maximum extent. At the point to which you start saying that there is a common religion that imposes its will on the other people, and it imposes the other people as dissidents, that's where you start having more conflict. We say on our side of the house that if, as long as you have more religions with more religious tenets which are more exclusive, but there are many options on that exclusivity, that is where you get the true religious fulfillment that only you can achieve, not the big, inclusive, fluffy stuff that came from affirmative, ladies and gentlemen, and we're still very proud to oppose. Opposition is that, well, like, we are imposing this one single. 
biblical values. We are indulging God with that we are imposing anything on this earth in today's day, considering that it is a valid judgment to debate. And the only response that came from opposition with them is that, well, there is no other option to begin with. But just because there is no other option does not exist, does not mean that we are going to impose this value even on their side of primitive. They need to engage in a scenario why it is, why we, why they need to engage in a scenario why when we do not impose this value, why they still have to support more topics on their side of opposition. Because their analysis is contingent upon the idea that this is an this is an that we're imposing to these people. We think conflict exists and that's a harm that we need to recognize on their side of opposition. But secondly, let's talk about salvation because their, law, their main benefit is that salvation is different and that's why we need to fulfill each and everyone's, each, each and everyone's demand. But we still don't understand why exactly is the difference demand and different salvation in and of itself something that's extremely important in the very first place. They never, they never told us why different people existing cannot mean that you can't satisfy the demand on their side of printed with one religion in itself. People still believe in God on their side of printed. We think that's a new form of God that also exists on their side of printed. And that's exactly what we're providing as a benefit. Because more people more people within one sacred religion mean that there's more authority, mean that there's more confidence, and they mean that you can counter within different kinds of discourse on their side of printed. Ultimately, if you have more count, if you have more confidence in and of itself with the side of printed, that in itself is also a one part of salvation that you can't guarantee on their side of printed. So that wasn't an issue to the benefit on their side of opposition. But ultimately, we think the difference between the opposition and the side of primitive is that we guarantee more choice. They might guarantee diversity ultimately on their side of opposition, but considering there's always going to be this structural barrier of difference that simply tells Muslims and Christians are different, you simply increase more of the harm on their side of primitive. We simply abolish all kinds of barriers. We told them that you can believe in one single identity within the boundary of one religion, and that's exactly when we're able to minimize the harm because you disregard any kind of difference within that situation. Ultimately, we think benefit stands more on their side of primitive, harm exists more side of, on side of opposition. We're extremely proud to um, win here.